The submarine known as Nautilus makes its historic and very first debut in Jules Verne's classic science fiction masterpiece, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was originally published back in 1869. In the story, the Nautilus serves as both a sophisticated underwater research laboratory and a formidable military submarine, and at that time, it was viewed as nothing less than a truly astonishing feat of engineering. Hello everyone! This fictional vessel left such a powerful and long-lasting impression on people's imaginations that even now, countless hotels, restaurants, spacecraft, and supercomputers bear its name in tribute. And naturally, actual submarines are among the proud namesakes as well. These real-life submarines might not be quite as famous as the legendary one from the novel, yet their own exploits were, in the day, equally awe-inspiring. Welcome to our channel! Today, we'll be diving into the story of this very Nautilus submarine and its perilous expedition. The North Pole The North Pole sits atop a vast sheet of ice floating on the Arctic Ocean's surface, and for countless years, people believed it was utterly unreachable. Early on, humanity's attempts to reach the pole were motivated by the hope of finding a convenient maritime route. But by the early 20th century, pursuing the North Pole had turned into more of a heated competition among brave and exceptionally tough explorers. When Robert Perry proclaimed in 1909 that he had reached the North Pole, most assumed the race had been conclusively won. However, many modern scholars now believe that Perry's party did not actually arrive at the true geographic North Pole. That is because his account appears to lack genuine credibility or convincing evidence. Nevertheless, even after Perry's well-known expedition, explorers remained irresistibly drawn to the Pole. One such adventurer was an Australian named Sir George Hubert Wilkins. He was an audacious traveler who wore many hats pilot, writer, photographer, and indeed a dreamer at heart. In 1928, Wilkins and Carl Ben Eilson battled through a fierce storm to reach the finish, thereby becoming the first pilots to complete a trans-Arctic flight. In recognition of this victory, Wilkins was knighted, and that very same year, he also became the first person to fly over Antarctica. But in 1929, he struck upon an even more outrageous idea attempting to reach the North Pole by submarine. Wilkins deemed this plan entirely feasible and wanted to demonstrate that one could indeed make a voyage through those freezing, forbidding waters. When he presented this concept to the American financier Lincoln Ellsworth, Ellsworth was so moved that he agreed to sponsor the mission. The Nautilus For their journey to the North Pole, they selected a decommissioned American submarine called USS O-12 which they leased from the U.S. government for the remarkably low rate of $1 per year. Well, that fee was minimal, they poured the then hefty sum of $250,000 into modifying the submarine. This funding covered repairs to outdated equipment and the installation of everything they believed was crucial for operating beneath the Arctic ice. The bow of the submarine was reinforced with concrete and steel. Because the Nautilus would be traveling under thick ice rather than in typical open waters, they mounted powerful forward lights protected by durable glass. A clever probe, reminiscent of a trolley pole, was added. Whenever it brushed the underside of the ice, it sent a signal to the ballast control system, helping prevent any unintentional collisions with the ice above. The torpedo room was partly converted into a workspace for underwater operations, and on top, they installed a retractable deckhouse, fitted with a drill capable of boring through ice up to 4 meters thick. Additionally, they mounted three more drills that could create openings up to 30 meters deep to supply fresh air to the diesel engines. Thus, this submarine became a showcase of that era's cutting-edge technology. Public enthusiasm for the project was immense, and the organizers received nearly 2,000 volunteer applications from those eager to sign on. Of course, that is hardly surprising, since this was a chance not only to reach the North Pole, but also to get there aboard the Nautilus, an opportunity that very few would wish to miss. Indeed, it was to be carried out on none other than the Nautilus itself. 
After all, this submarine had been renamed in honor of Jules Verne's famous invention, and Jules Verne's grandson, John Jules Verne, even attended the christening. It was all very symbolic, wasn't it? Traditionally, one would smash a champagne bottle against the ship's hull, but instead they used a bucket of ice. This bucket not only represented the upcoming voyage through Arctic ice, but also met the requirements of America's prohibition laws. At the ceremony, Lady Wilkins pronounced the following words, To this vessel I bestow upon you the name Nautilus. Embark now on an adventure brimming with wonders and marvels. Within your hull there lies a sacred treasure, held safe and dear. Return it to me unharmed and entirely intact. Naturally, this treasure meant the people aboard, especially her husband George, so her heartfelt wish is easy to understand. The Voyage of the Nautilus The organizers were well aware that this expedition would be anything but simple, yet they did not realize just how formidable it would truly be. On June 4, 1931, the Nautilus set sail from America's east coast bound for Europe, specifically Bergen in Norway. Although they were already two months behind schedule, by the time they had crossed the Atlantic it was clear the expedition's start would be postponed. The Nautilus was battered by a severe storm, which led to the failure of two diesel engines. The expedition team sent out an SOS and was rescued by the battleship Wyoming. The submarine was towed to Britain for further repairs, which took an entire month. Still, this delay allowed the Prince of Wales to come and see the curious attraction afloat for himself. At last, on August 1, 1931, the Nautilus reached Norway, where it boarded the renowned scientist and expedition advisor Harold Sverdrup, then it continued on to Spitsbergen Island. From that point forward, they entered a realm defined by brutal cold and perilous conditions. While the expedition team conducted meteorological and oceanographic observations, along with collecting plankton and water samples, they also struggled with recurring crises. The hull began leaking and the diesel engines failed yet again, forcing repairs at the port of Longyearbyen. Though the Nautilus departed on August 18th, it encountered heavy pack ice by August 19th, prompting the crew to prepare for a dive. For Wilkins, this was a moment fraught with tension. After all, he was staking his reputation on proving that navigating beneath the ice was truly possible. They were fully ready to submerge, but then Captain Dannenhauer suddenly realized the horizontal rudder was missing. It may have been torn off by the ice, although Wilkins suspected sabotage. Either way, without the horizontal rudder, the submarine could not move properly underwater. Most people would have given up right then, but Wilkins was made of different metal. Following his orders, extra ballast was placed in the bow, causing it to tilt at a 15-degree angle and slip underneath the ice. This was the only true success of the expedition, and that spot became the northernmost point the submarine ever reached. Thus, any hope of proceeding to the North Pole became impossible. The Nautilus returned to Spitsbergen Island. The vessel was significantly damaged, leaking in two areas and listing some 30 degrees to one side. The drilling rig was destroyed, while the radio mast, periscope and propeller were all impaired as well. In line with the lease agreement, the submarine was then towed out to deep water and scuttled. And so ended the tale of that Nautilus, but our story does not quite end there. A New Journey for the Nautilus On January 21, 1954, yet another Nautilus went into service this time the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. Thanks to its nuclear propulsion, this new submarine could remain submerged far longer than any diesel-driven craft, setting multiple records during its early years. Naturally, one such accomplishment was a successful voyage to the North Pole. The Nautilus finally reached the northernmost point on the planet. Still not everything went as smoothly as many had envisioned. The first attempt occurred in 1957, when a submarine under Commander William Anderson set off to achieve that lofty goal. In these polar regions, equipment does not function as it would in most other parts of the Earth. Because the magnetic and geographic poles do not perfectly align, a magnetic compass is essentially useless. Even a gyro compass cannot be relied upon to work properly up there. 
While under the ice, Captain Anderson decided to surface through an opening in the frozen pack. Unfortunately, the ice measuring device or ice fathometer also malfunctioned. On September 2nd, the submarine damaged its periscope and deck fairing while surfacing. Relying on sheer luck, the captain turned the submarine around and managed to steer the Nautilus back to its previous position. One year later, the sub made a second attempt, and by then the crew was better prepared for the trials ahead. Before that, Anderson, along with Dr. Waldo Lyon from the U.S. Navy's Arctic Submarine Laboratory, covertly flew over the Bering Strait using forged documents, scouting out areas where the ice was so thick a submarine should never venture. Thanks to that preparation, despite ongoing challenges, on August 3, 1958, the Nautilus reached the geographic North Pole at long last. In doing so, it fulfilled the dream of that passionate explorer George Wilkins, who was still alive to learn that the North Pole had indeed been reached by a submarine. Sir Wilkins passed away on November 30, 1958. Just a few months later, but on March 17, 1959, yet another American submarine, the USS Skate, arrived at the North Pole and became the first to surface there. After hoisting the American flag, the crew paid tribute to George Wilkins by scattering his ashes over that very spot. It was the place he had fought so desperately to reach, and it became his final resting ground. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button and share it across your social media pages. We truly appreciate your support as always. Until we meet again, take care and farewell.